student presentations uh, from the different student projects that were done during the colloquium in the past uh, three weeks. We would like to thank the student mentors again for all the projects, um, for all the work that went into the preparation, especially the hard work put in by all the students for um, yeah, getting impressive results just in a short period of time. So we had posted an order in terms of the presentation of the projects. The first group that will be the Klimpred group would be present of Pauline, will you? Oh, yep. yeah, yes, like uh, sorry, sorry, I, I will have, have to jump my camera, camera because, because I think it's uh, okay. But you hear me properly? Uh, I'm getting an echo. Mm. Okay. Is the bagging chest better now? Maybe if you reduce your speaker volume, the echo might reduce, I think. Okay, okay. it's very really low. low. Sound now? now? Is, is it better or? It's a bit better. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Shall, Shall I give it a try, try anyway? Yeah, let's try and be. Oh, sorry. Unless someone. Is it. Okay. okay. Do, do, do you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. I'll give you an eight minute warning. Okay. Okay, okay great. great. I, I'm, like, like, we, we will be several to. to to go, go through, through the slides, slides and, and Paul will we'll start, start them just, just sharing, sharing the screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our group um, was working on uh, S2S verification uh, using Climpred, uh, which is um, a Python package that was developed um, by our facilitator, Aaron Spring. And there were uh, seven uh, students participating in this uh, in total. Oops, there we go. Um, so we divided ourselves into four subgroups and just a brief uh, project overview for each of the groups. Innocent and I um, were looking at sudden stratospheric warming over the United States. Irina was looking at uh, state dependent predictability of two meter temperature depending on the NAO phases. Jan and Matt were looking at state dependent predictability, particularly the influence of the MJO phase at initialization on European forecasts. And Pauline and Shinja were looking at uh, estimating prediction skills in precipitation hindcasts. Uh, so the question that Innocent and I asked uh, were, uh, do SSWs lead to a better two meter temperature predictive skill over the United States? And so we looked at three different models, um, the WACCM, CESM2, and the ECMWF models. Each of these were initialized weekly. Uh, we looked at the United States and two meter temperature. Um, the forecast time that we used was 1999 to 2020. And during this period, uh, there were 16 SSW events. And the metric that we used um, to evaluate was the difference in root mean squared error between the SSW events and the non-SSW uh, winter time, which is December, January, February. And so this difference in root mean squared error um, can be plotted as a function of lead time as shown, um, where a positive value means that SSWs actually led to a worse prediction and a negative value means that SSWs led to a better prediction. And so going through each of these three models, um, the WACCM model um, for lead times zero to 10 um, actually had worse predictions during SSWs, um, but at lead times about 15 to 30 days um, ahead of time um, had better predictions during SSWs. Uh, CESM2 model, um, there was very little difference um, in predictions between SSW events and non-SSW events. And the ECMWF, uh, which is the green line um, for all lead times um, had better predictions during SSWs. And just to note that um, the bumpiness in these curves um, we think is likely caused by there being relatively few events um, that were analyzed. And so general conclusion from our subgroup is that uh, SSWs can lead to better prediction skill 
um, but that's dependent upon lead time and also model. So I'm, I'm presenting um, the results from Irina and um, she looked at um, the NAO and the impact on two meter temperature in two different models in the in one with normal top, the CSM2, and then one with a higher top, WACCM. And um, she found that for, you can see here the top two, top four figures for lead time of 15 days, there's um, higher skill for forecasts that are initialized um, in NAO positive um, for the region of Europe and also most, most of Asia. And she doesn't really see a difference between the two models. So the high and low top doesn't seem to play um, a high role for, for this region. Then she also looked more the specifically for this Eurasia region, more at the temporal evolution of the forecast skill in the two models. And she can see that the forecast skill decays as you would expect um, fairly quickly. And that for forecast weeks three and four, she sees a higher skill for the Eurasia region using the higher top model. Um, yeah. So me and Jan were looking into how the MGO phase affects forecast skill over Europe. So we decided to focus on phases two and three and six and seven, the standard patterns which are shown on the left of this slide, as these tend to give the strongest telecommunication pattern towards Europe. And the results of this were that after about two weeks, when initiated in MGO phase six and seven, forecasts seem to become much worse than climatology. But this isn't seen in any other phases. So I guess to find out how, why this happened, we, on the next slide, looked at the geospatial pattern of root mean square error. So on these maps, the red regions are forecast better when the MJO is in phases six and seven, and blue regions are forecast worse. So we can see, especially in the weeks three and four, that in the North Pacific, there is a much better forecast skill, but this better skill doesn't make it across to Europe. And I guess following on from that, we've been, we've been wondering how this relates to the increased bias of the ECMWF model over Iceland in the same MJO phase. I'm Pauline and I work on estimating prediction skew of precipitation and after it is corrected by quantile mapping. And as you know, that post-processing is necessary um, before a model forecast can be practically applied. So quantile mapping is a very useful tool for post-processing assemble model for cards. And we choose this method because um, precipitation is not normally distributed. And so simple bias correction is not very applicable. And the theory behind this quantile mapping is to match the CDF of raw forecast to the CDF of observations. And so we applied the quantile mapping in clean thread and to the hand cuts of precipitation in different countries from ECMWF model. And we use several different metrics to estimate the prediction skew. And here we take the continuous uh, ranked probability score uh, as an example. And you can see that after the correction by quantile mapping, uh, the skew in improved obviously and uh, because the lower value of the CRPS, the better skew of the model gives. We also extended the verification uh, by uh, the differentiating it according to the different basis of different processes. Uh, and here uh, you can see the anomaly uh, correlation coefficient depending on depending on whether we are in different, different phases, phases of, for example, example NAO or ESO or NGO. And so far, we didn't uh, see that, that much uh, that, that, that much difference in, in the scale between the general behaviors. But, but this is just the first, first analysis, analysis, and we hope maybe to find more results. 
uh, with the other chemical accumulations of precipitation, for example, or, or by, by focusing on a special intensity of precipitation, for example, in streams. Um, I, I hope you hear me properly. properly. It's echo. I can uh, hear an echo falling, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You have one more minute for the. Okay. okay. So I'll, 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 I'll be quick on the take-home take -home messages. Um, so, uh, uh, in a sense, I'm going to show that generally the presence of certain stratospheric one one can be to a better model performance. Sorry, and in a highlight that there is a better skill for to measure temperature during positive and negative phase. Uh, Jan and Matt showed us that, that uh, there is an increased forecast error uh, if, if the forecast is initiated, initiated in phase 6 or 7 of NGO. And then with the Kinka, we, uh, we investigated, um, we, we explored the post processing with the, with the help of our uh, with the development of the content and in the and we realized the improvement of the protection here. And uh, with this quick analysis, we didn't notice any difference in the forecast here depending on different phases. Uh, we, we thought about some, some possible collaboration between the groups. Uh, for uh, example, in the St. Paul and the Union are working on two meter temperatures, and maybe some uh, investigation on compound effect of the sudden stratospheric warming and also an AO uh, compound effect on two meter temperature predicting the option. Um, also, also to push further the, uh, the analysis of the impact of, of NGO uh, uh, BNI on precipitation. So we'll be working, uh, uh, like Jan and Matt may be working with the and, and also more generally, the analysis of precipitation can be uh, applied to every, every method that, uh, that occurred on the other, the other groups. So we'd like, like to thank you very much. much. For your attention, thank you. Thank you to everyone for the precious help and in in our project. So, so thank, thank you very much for your time. time. And, and thanks, thanks a lot to our organization, of course, for the organization and for the wonderful workshop, which was full of opportunities and we learned a lot. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pauline. And thanks all for your yeah, great results and things to think about. Um, so we'll move to our next group presentation. We'll come back to question answers and discussion either after all the four discussions, but we also have more time this afternoon for longer discussions and presenting more results. So thanks. Our next group will be the PyWR, PyCPT. Good morning. My name is Kyle Lessinger, and I'm here to briefly introduce you to our current research into weather typing using the Python package PyWR, developed by our leads, Angel Munoz and Andrew Robertson. Additional members of our research group include Danny Du, Pedro Herrera, Kyle, or me, Kyle Lessinger, Kelsey Malloy, and Kyle Nardi. So in mid-July 2021, there was large-scale flooding that occurred over Western Europe due to heavy sustained precipitation and then the flooding had a large impact on both human lives and damage to property. With this event in mind, and our selection of the Pi WR research group, our research goal was to understand specific weather types over the North Atlantic that cause extreme events. And then ultimately, we'd like to increase forecast skill on the S2S timescale for these extremes. So here we see a time series on the left of 500 hectopascal geopotential height between July 1st and July 22nd over Western Europe. We see these low height fields and they're pervasive for several days and then they transition out. And then also on the right, we see um, the same pattern on a, uh, the July 14th. And so this is, and these aren't in the exact coordinate boxes, so they're not meant to be exactly the same, um, but we can still see that same pattern. And these are the kind of the types of weather types that we're looking to understand a little bit more so we can find out if they have any sources of predictability. So previous research has already identified that weather typing is an established method for identifying recurrent circulation patterns. And our methodology includes first applying a multivariable EOF field 
uh, to both 500 hectopascal geopotential height and integrated water vapor. Next, we ran a k-means clustering loop for four different weather types to identify recurrent circulation patterns. And then we finally analyzed various sources of predictability from local sources and teleconnections. So our data include inset reanalysis for both global uh, geopotential height and integrated water vapor and CPC precipitation. Uh, it's a global unified gauge-based daily precipitation. So we use this to identify the land-based extremes. So here we see our first set of images for weather typing uh, using a coupled EOF for the first row is geopotential height, the second row is integrated water vapor, and then the third row is precipitation. So we coupled the geopotential height and the water vapor, and this represents uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the explained variance. So we see these four weather types in the summer over the North Atlantic, and we see the NAO, Scandinavian blocking, and the, even a ridge-like pattern. And without coupling of the geopotential height and integrated water vapor, then we wouldn't have seen a strong signal with weather type three, which is the Scandinavian blocking uh, with the low pressure. And so this is kind of the weather type that we're looking for, for extreme patterns that kind of affected uh, Europe. So uh, kind of similar pattern. And so we're gonna explore a little bit more about um, this specific weather type. And then you can see at the very bottom precipitation, it is a composite of precipitation for each day's weather type. And so that we do see some are more likely to cause more or less precipitation over time. So with all these patterns in mind, we can start asking questions about weather type, their prevalence and predictability. So when we just saw summer and now this is the winter EOF, uh, coupled EOF, and it's pretty much a different picture, but we do see a stronger signal for the patterns. And so that's pretty much the only mention for this point. So we then explored uh, extreme wet and dry events that were associated with those specific weather types to identify when excessively wet or dry conditions occurred. So we had our own definitions for what a wet and dry event is, um, and you can ask us that later if you'd like. But uh, for this one, we wanna look at summer, the top part, we're gonna look at weather type three. So across Western Europe, it does display more extreme wet days and less extreme dry days. So then for winter, we want to look at weather type one. And then this is the NAO positive, and it shows the highest percentage of wet days across the Western Europe, and as opposed to um, and a lower persistence of dry days. And then I will move it on to Kyle. All right. Uh, thanks, Kyle. My name is Kyle Nardi. I will present the second half of this talk. So the next step is to explore some of the sources of predictability for these weather types. So first we explore sources of summertime predictability and one potential source is the East Asian monsoon. So here we show anomalous probability based on a specific East Asian monsoon state. Uh, we separate into weak, neutral, and strong. And we show anomalous probability of a particular weather type in the days leading up to and the days following one of the particular East Asian monsoon phases. So what's noteworthy here is we have several areas where there are anomalously low or anomalously high probabilities of a particular weather type occurring in the days after either the weak or the strong East Asian monsoon phase, indicating that this could be a potential source of predictability for these weather types during the summer. So a potential um, avenue of future research is to understand why this is occurring physically. So these are just some preliminary plots showing the geopotential height pattern and not the geopotential height anomaly patterns for the specific weather types over the hemispheric domain. And our goal in the future is to understand whether or not there's some sort of dynamical response due to the East Asian monsoon in the summertime. So now we explore a predictability during the winter and one established source of predictability is the MJO. So this is a plot of anomalous frequency of um, occurrence for different NAO phases, NAO positive and NAO negative. Um, in the days before and the days after a particular MJO phase. Any MJO phase shown here is high amplitude and the RMM uh, amplitude greater than one. And then we have a phase zero here, which indicates um, a low amplitude MJO phase um, of any of the one day phases. So what's noteworthy here is that we have an area of a propagating MJO signal, especially in NAO negative. And this is something 
that has been shown actually in other studies. This was a figure that was shown a few days ago in a talk. This is from Kasu et al. 2008. And it indicates that the phase of the MJO can modulate the phase of the NAO uh, in the week, days and weeks um, after the phase occurs. So in comparison to what we found, we found very similar results, namely that um, essentially five to 15 days after MGO phases three and four, we get an anomalously high probability of occurrence for NAO positive. And then in the five to 15 days after phases six through eight, we get an anomalously high probability of occurrence for NAO negative. So again, the MJO prevent, uh, produces a potential source of predictability for the NAO during the winter time. Um, another piece of the puzzle is exploring how some of these weather types have changed in frequency over time. So this is analysis from 1871 to 2008 from the NOAA 20th century reanalysis. And it's exploring how the probability of occurrence for these four weather types has changed over time in both the winter and the summer. So this plot here shows the relative trend magnitude of each weather type over this time period for both the winter and the summer. And any area here shown in color uh, has a statistically significant relative trend magnitude at 90% confidence. So what's noteworthy here in the winter is that weather type three, which we found to be a wetter weather type, increases in frequency over time dur during this time period. Whereas in the summertime, weather type three actually um, is less frequent in terms of uh, probability of occurrence over this time period. The opposite occurs for weather type four, which we find to be the drier weather type. Um, during the winter, weather type four becomes less frequent and uh, weather type four during the summer becomes more frequent, indicating that these weather types are changing in frequency over time. And as a result, the probability of these extreme precipitation events could also be changing over time. And you have one more minute. All right, thank you. So um, our conclusions are um, the main goal of the study was to connect extreme wet and dry events over Europe to certain weather types over the North Atlantic. And we showed that extreme precipitation events are favored under certain uh, North Atlantic weather types. And we also are interested in exploring the predictability of these weather types. And we found that specific phases of the East Asian monsoon during the summer and the MJO during the winter could contribute to windows of opportunity for forecasting some of these patterns. And we also found that regimes are changing in frequency over time, and that potentially is gonna to lead to changes in frequency of these extreme weather events. Our future work, we feel there are many avenues of future research uh, from this topic. Uh, we're interested in better understanding the physical mechanisms driving these extreme events under certain weather types. Uh, for example, we've done an analysis of atmospheric rivers, and we found that atmospheric rivers are more frequent under certain weather types. So that could be one source of precipitation uh, from these weather types. We're also interested in evaluating model depictions of these weather types and seeing if the subseasonal uh, seasonal teleconnection patterns from the East Asian monsoon and the MJO also are prevalent within the S2S models. And we're interested in exploring some of the relationships governing uh, the weather types, the occurrence of these weather types, and the modes of climate variability, whether it be NAO, MGO, as we showed, uh, or PNA, potentially even lower frequency modes of cli climate variability like QBO or ENSO. So um, thank you for your attention. This was our group. Uh, it was a great group to work with. We definitely want to thank uh, Andy Robertson and Angel Munoz, who wasn't able to be here today for their guidance. And if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to discuss during the uh, longer form discussion. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks all again. Impressive work. Uh, thank you. So our next group will be the hydro hydrology group. Whenever you're ready, you can share screen and start. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So our group uh, uh, looked at hydrology, S2S uh, forecasts for hydrology applications. And uh, we were uh, led by John and Andy. And our group members were Eric, Kahong, Funing, and myself. And uh, 
we actually started off with something different. So I'll present the first part of our work and then uh, Eric will take over for the second uh, investigation. So we initially started with uh, looking at an, uh, basically an optimization problem for a dam in uh, Japan. And uh, we were using um, a runoff from uh, era five and uh, optimizing for power generation. Uh, G here, uh, using uh, this differential equation where I is like river runoff, W is a flow rate through the turbines and R is the relief flow. Uh, under two particular constraints, uh, depending on the level of uh, the water level and uh, flow rate W. So the constraints were on W and uh, head height H. And uh, right, so uh, if you focus on the top uh, left here, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, dark uh, orange box, the smaller box, that's uh, the grid size for the uh, era five uh, data. Whereas uh, the uh, lighter yellow box is the uh, uh, S2S database uh, grid size. So we already see uh, some issues that we would face here. And uh, if you look at the time series, the top time series on the uh, on the right, we see when we uh, incorporate the ensemble forecasts on around day 120, we see there are some ensembles uh, which are negative. So um, there were some issues there. And another particular reason for this uh, uh, start day was we had an extreme event, uh, extreme precipitation. We wanted to see how um, that would affect uh, the optimization. And so uh, we tried to apply some bias correction and uh, we used the CDF uh, matching, where we matched the uh, S2S uh, CDF to the uh, uh, ERA 5 CDF. And then when we applied that uh, bias corrected uh, uh, ensembles, we get this uh, bottom bias corrected uh, time series for uh, runoff. So these, uh, this is a uh, time series for runoff. And then uh, we use the optimization uh, uh, to uh, uh, obtain a time series for uh, a few uh, values. So we had inflow, uh, head height in orange, green was the flow rate, uh, R is, uh, red is the relief flow and uh, the purple line is for power generation, which we were optimizing for. And so the first, uh, the top figure is uh, uh, showing just one ensemble member uh, before bias correction was applied. And we see uh, around, actually when we start uh, incorporating the um, uh, ensemble uh, member forecast on around day 120 approximately, we see that we get some negative values for uh, generation. So we see that uh, this uh, ensemble is causing some issues with the optimization model. And then at the bottom is the bias corrected uh, ensembles. So these are ensemble means for these particular uh, parameters. And we see we get some uh, relatively useful values. Uh, one thing, uh, since our direction uh, of a project change, we don't show uh, these um, uh, the RMSE and uh, comparison with the uh, climatology and uh, persistence. But uh, this is as far as we got for the first part of the project. And I will let uh, Eric uh, hand it over to Eric. Thanks, Ashneel. Can you keep uh, going along the slides for me? Thank you. Cool. So our second project involved using S2S data to inform ensemble stream flow prediction. Uh, and I'll get into all what all that all means in just a second. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the idea is um, if you want to predict stream flow in a basin, Depending on the basin you're in, you can actually get a lot of information just from the initial land surface uh, moisture conditions. Um, and what they found out is if you can use, if you use 
historical weather and force it through a hydrologic model and take the ensemble mean of that, as long as you have the initial land surface and moisture conditions, then you'll have a pretty accurate representation of um, the flow into the future, as long as you're, you know, in the right time of uh, time of the year. So in spring, if you know, you know, how much snow and, and water is in your in your watershed, then you're going to know basically how high your peak's going to be. And so that that idea is called the uh, ensemble um, stream flow prediction. Um, but what, what it's lacking is any actual information of future weather and climate. So what we wanted to do is to use future weather and climate data to um, weigh different ensemble members and, and provide an alternate weighting of ensemble members. Instead of just the mean, we'd have, we'd put more stress on ones where uh, we, that's where we thought the future would more likely be. So in this study, we look at the Buffalo Bill Reservoir in Wyoming. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so what we, to do this project, we had needed four pieces of the puzzle. First, we had observed stream flow into Buffalo Bill Reservoir, about 40 years of it. We got the observed meteorology from ERA-5, focusing on two meter temperature and precipitation along with S2S um, forecasts of two meter uh, precipitation and temperature. And what we do is we create a rank table. And what a rank table is, is you have your historical record of um, temperature and precipitation, you know, two weeks ahead. And you compare that value for every year. So, you know, if we're starting on April 1st and we have our S2S data, for two weeks ahead, that would be, you know, April 1st, April 15th, once the average temperature, how does that compare year to year? So the lowest temperature would have a low rank and the highest would have a high rank. So if 2016 had a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and 2000 had a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, then 2016 would be ranked higher. Uh, and they're, they're kind of um, ranked between zero and one. Um, and so we do that for the S2S forecast, as well as the observed meteorological um, values we have um, over the same time periods. And we build rank tables for both of those. And we also have these S2S watershed flow forecasts where we take a hydrologic model, force it with historical weather data, like I described earlier. And then we have these ensemble members that say, okay, I have, um, 40 different years of, of weather data forced through this, this hydrologic model based on this initialization date. And so tip, typical waiting. One more minute, Derek. One more minute? Okay, I'll go quicker. Yeah. <laughs> um, and basically, we just wanted to check, you know, can we use S2S data to better inform our waiting? Um, so next slide, please. Next slide. Um, sorry, yeah, right here. So the first thing we wanted to check is which S2S data set would work best. And we found that they all had similar spreads, so any of them would be appropriate. Feature work will be used to actually select the best set, but for now, any, any are fine. Next slide. Um, and then we tested different weighting functions. So the idea is which ensemble members to weigh more and by how much. Um, it, we found that the less emphasis we gave to any single member, the better our accuracy is. We didn't want anything too wild because if you miss a peak, you know, completely, then you're going to have a worse performance than just a straight line. Uh, so next slide. And so between selecting our, our S2S data, between understanding our um, weighting function, we also introduced um, climate oscillation indices from ENSO and the Pacific North American oscillation to see if those helped at all. And what we found is if we took, if, if we took the S2S forecast of precipitation temperature and gave that half, half the weighting value and the other half we gave it to the ENSO and PNA states at the time, then overall, 
if you look at the bottom summary stats, overall, we can just barely outperform the ensemble mean. Um, uh, I Graphically, we're showing a um, very good case in 2016 where we beat uh, the ensemble mean by almost uh, 0.1 in the modified clean loop efficiency and, and by almost 0.2 in Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. So much better prediction than just the ensemble mean. Uh, however, overall, we still have a lot of work to do before we you know, can really claim we're better. Um, so next slide, please. So the idea is SOS forecasts and climate oscillation states do help with future forecasting. Uh, we, we have a lot of potential to do, and we have some future steps, uh, including looking at what works and what doesn't, different days we can start at, and what different, and using climate oscillation transitions rather than their states. So we're looking forward to new directions and we're open to anyone's comments or suggestions. Thanks so much, sorry for going over. Great, thanks Eric, and thanks all. Really great work, um, it's with two different projects. So our next group is um, the US West Coast Precipitation Prediction Group. Okay, I'm gonna be presenting. Um, sorry. Okay, is that okay. full screen? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> okay. So hi everyone, my name is Deanna Nash and I will be presenting on behalf of the US West Coast Tutorial Group. The other student members of this group are Janak, Nikos, Alex, and Bill. Uh, and this group was led by Anisha and Mike. So today I'll be telling you about our project regarding S2S prediction of a series of atmospheric river or AR events that made landfall in the Western US during the winter in 2017 and led to several extreme rainfall events, which damaged the main spillway of the Oroville Dam in February, 2017, which is pictured on the far left. On the plot in the middle, we see that the AR landfall frequency during the 2017 water year was higher than average at most latitudes. And the plot on the right from White et al. is, uh, is showing the precipitation during 2017 water year was 300% of normal at the Oroville Dam, which is indicated by the black cross on the map. So the science goal of this project is to provide a hind cast scale assessment for AR activity, integrated water vapor transport, or IVT, and precipitation prior to the Oroville Dam incident in February 2017. So to complete this, our group explored the hind cast scale through a variety of facets, including MJO connections, synoptic conditions, IVT and precipitation forecasts, and AR probability forecasts. So first, let's look at the MJO connections. The plot on the left is showing the RMM index values for November 2016 to March 2017. So we focused on a particular AR event, um, which happened on February 5th, as indicated by the yellow star. And this was the event right before the Oroville Dam incident. MJO was in phase five and six during this AR event and had a really high amplitude above uh, two RMM index value. And this really aligns with what we know from previous research. And so our plot on the right is showing the five day rolling mean of daily anomalies of AR landfall frequency in California, broken down by the active MJO phase and different lags from zero to the 35 days. So if we look at the 20 to 25 lead before our AR event, the MJO was roughly in phase one. And if we reference the plot on the right, we would expect to see below AR landfall frequency in California, um, which doesn't really align with what was happening. So, or what happened 20 to 25 days later. So for a 20 to 25 day lead time, this particular event is not in accordance with our long-term statistics, though other work has shown a really strong connection with ARs and MJO. So next we'll explore the synoptic characteristics leading up to this AR event. The figures on the left are showing the weekly 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies 
where the forecast values are shaded and the observed values are the contour lines. A progressive pattern characterized by an equatorward shifted and extended jet along with cyclogenesis in the Central Pacific was observed leading up to the Oroville Dam incident. Cold air surges off East Asia by the week of the event increased the tropospheric meridional temperature gradient, thereby enhancing and retracting the North Pacific jet that led to enhanced cyclogenesis in the Central Pacific induced by deep Western North Pacific troughing over the February 1st through 7th week period. So this cyclone activity aided in the development of downstream ridging over the Western US and subsequently over the Bering Sea via poleward latent heat transport. So this uh, ridging or blocking or omega regime conditions were conducive to multiple AR uh, events in California. So the figures on the right are showing the forecasted daily geopotential heights with a three to 21 day lead. And we see that this observed omega block uh, in the contour lines is only accurately forecasted up to seven days in advance. So here we have the forecast skill exploration of IVT and precipitation. So the top row plots show the forecasted precipitation for February 7th at four different lead times. And the correlation values, uh, which are a little small in these plots, tell us that precipitation in general is poorly forecasted, even with a one day lead. So we can actually use IVT as a proxy for ARs and precipitation, um, which is shown in the bottom row of those plots, where the forecast is shaded and the observed data is shown in black contours. We have a weak pattern correlation of 0.39 for the first forecast that's 12 days out. But as you get closer um, to the actual event or the lead time decreases, the forecast becomes much more similar. Um, we analyzed the scale of the forecasts at different lead times for the period January 1st through May 12th. And the top panel on the right is showing the mean of each ensemble member's spatial anomaly correlation in black and the anomaly correlation of the ensemble mean in blue. It shows that there's a bit more scale for the ensemble mean, but both drop below 0.4 within 10 days. The bottom panel is showing the root mean square error of the ensemble mean compared to the spread of the forecast. Spread follows very similar to the root mean square error and it increases rapidly with lead time prior to 10 days, and then it levels off. So if we focus in on the forecasted IVT in the grid cells or the area around Oroville Dam, which is indicated on the map as the black dots, we can see that the model skill is dependent on initialization. And the colored lines in the figure on the left represent the ensemble means for various initialization times. And the black line is the observation. So for example, the orange line is the ensemble mean for the model initialized on February 2nd and the forecast scale around uh, the peak in IVT on February 21st is uh, greatly decreased. So that particular initialization time doesn't do well in that second peak. But if we compare this to the cyan line, which was initialized a little bit later on February 16th, it does a better job representing that peak in IVT on the 21st of February. If we look at ensemble spread, uh, the figure on the right is just the same as the figure on the left, but the shaded regions represent the each ensemble spread. And this is just telling us that certain initializations have more spread than others. And then last, we looked at the number of ensembles that detected an AR for a two to three week lead. So the shaded contours in the figures on the left are showing the odds that an AR was detected at that grid cell uh, for that time. And then the black contours indicate an AR was detected by the observation data. So for day-to-day -day probabilities, the model has some skill at predicting the spatial location of an AR up to a 10-day lead. If we look at the number of ensembles that forecasted a detected AR within a 17 to 23-day lead, roughly a three-week lead, uh, the model predicted that the AR frequency was going to be much higher than the climatological average, which is quite accurate. Um, it doesn't necessarily catch the spatial scale of the AR, um, but the general frequency for that week was well done. Um, and so in conclusion, 
We did make some progress on answering our question on S2S model scale for AR events leading up to the Oroville Dam crisis. However, like any good research project worth pursuing, we discovered that our one question led to several other questions. For example, can we improve our results with a bias correction? Or what kind of scale do we have in predicting multiple AR events in one season or high intensity AR events um, compared to lower intensity AR events? Can we leverage our knowledge of MJO, QBO, and ENSO to improve our prediction skill? And so in all, we only really saw skill and predictions of this AR event uh, at least less than two weeks. And for more discussion, please come to our extended session this afternoon. Thank you. Great, <laughs> thanks Diana and thanks all in the group for a really, again, an impressive amount of work in such a short period. So thank you. So we have set us, we had set aside 15 minutes, um, which originally was a break for student feedback. We still have a, yeah, three to five minutes and then we'll take a 10 minute break before the next plenary talk. So does anyone have questions for any of the student groups? I don't see any right now in the chat, but I had one for, oh, Zane, did you have a question? I see you're unmuted. Oh, no, Shui. sorry, I just unmuted myself by accident. Right. Yeah, Shui, go ahead. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, I have a question regarding this MGO influence on the downstream weather, both in Europe and the atmosphere river. Uh, it seemed to be that everyone indicating the phase six and seven seemed to have issues, right? So in fact, phase six and seven is when the MGO RMM index cannot tell you where the heating is, right? So a lot of downstream uh, weather impact depend on the convective heating precipitation. For instance, the uh, convective um, large scale convection generated the Raspi wave trend is in Northern Hemisphere. So if the convective heating of MGO is in Southern Hemisphere, you would have very different uh, impact. So um, have you all thought about actually using the actual precipitation tracking like we presented in the databases available to everyone? It's called large scale precipitation tracking. That tells you exactly when and where the convective heating is. Um, so I'll just yeah, speak for the I'll just speak for the Pi WR side. I think that's a really good suggestion. We we did not look at that, but I think that would actually be really fascinating, and it might, you know, increase the skill and, and maybe increase the um, the anomalous probabilities if we can sort of fine tune it a little bit. So that's a really good suggestion that we'll definitely take into account. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. And um, I guess the question also is, yeah, to the other groups, right? Yeah, yeah I can yeah, speak go for the for the um, Klimp at Europe group. Um, we did not consider to look into that, but we also would find it really interesting um, to look at the different propagations of the MGO. And, and yeah, it's definitely something that is very exciting and interesting to look at. Great, thanks, Jan. And so should we, we should work on getting that into Klimpred uh, as part of the state dependence. Yeah, yeah, very good. And I think the question is also to the US West Coast group that was looking at ARs and MJO teleconnection. Does anyone from that group want to respond, Diana or others? Yeah, maybe I can say so. Uh, indeed, we yeah. don't, also yeah. didn't do that, but uh, definitely it's something worth looking at. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, we're gonna do it uh, by time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks. The U.S. West Coast is in particular because MGO heating, if it is in northern northern hemisphere, yeah. that influences your synoptic pattern much more direct. And this is mm -hmm. a place where the heating split really strongly, either the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, rarely on the equator. Great, thanks. Thanks for the insights. We'll definitely have a look at it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again, Shui. It was a great suggestion. Um, so I had a question regarding the monsoon index that was used. Um, 
I think it was Kyle Nardi when you were presenting this slide. Did you use the seasonal mean monsoon? So maybe yeah, Kelsey, it was your analysis, like, you know, or was it the intra-seasonal component of the monsoon that you were looking at? Yeah, I can take this question. That's a really good question um, because we were focused on mostly, I would say, the sub-seasonal scale. Um, I used two different methods as kind of preliminary ways to look at the monsoon. There are actually a lot of different indices you can use. Um, I tested two, one being um, the definition using U850 circulation. So we have daily data that's run with a five day running mean for U850. And so we just calculated that circulation or I calculated that circulation um, and then looked at the relationship between, or I should say, we looked at the lead lag relationship between what that indice was um, based on that circulation. And then I also looked at uh, the circulation based on U200. So I looked at like upper and lower level ways to identify um, uh, the monsoon phases. But I am interested in kind of um, taking that to the next step by looking at the boreal summer um, intraseasonal oscillation or BSISO, because um, that looks at it in terms of phases like the MJO. So I think that that could be also really interesting to look at um, since we did that since we found stuff with like the MJO Lili relationships, right. um, maybe same with the monsoon. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that was going to be my other comment. And it's also related to Shui's comment about a lot of these teleconnections are related to convective heating and less so to the dynamical uh, forcing. And some of it is dynamical forcing, but a lot more to the convective heating, right? And just the wind indices may not capture that convective heating as aspect of it, so great. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I don't see other questions right now. We'll come back to a larger discussion in the afternoon. Thanks again to all four groups who presented in, oh, Judith. And I wanted to say thank you because um, part of it is uh, all the data crunching before a tutorial started and we use different databases, but I wanna say thanks to Abby J, who has uh, prepared a lot of the data that went especially into the, the CLIMPRED tutorials. Um, Anish downloaded, especially for the uh, uh, hydro and US West Coast. Um, and so uh, thanks so much for all the background, the work in the background and in data pre-processing and thanks to the tutorials. Yeah.